We talk about the history of this farm and all the generations that it goes back, but the fact of the matter is, in the 1980s, we were absolutely destitute. Our equity was gone, and we were forced with paying off a very large debt over a period of 25 years. And so my brother and I came back to a very dark time in agriculture. And we literally had to fight for our lives from, from the get-go. As soon as we started farming, we were behind the eight ball. We had no money. We had an old line of John Deere 4020 equipment. And so we just were absolutely terrified of failing. Our farm, it's a third generation. My grandfather uh, homesteaded in South Dakota, Western South Dakota, and then moved back to this area and settled in and farmed south of Mitchell. And then my dad started farming right here at the homestead. And then now we're the third generation. You know, we got corn surrounding this switchgrass and look at this switchgrass. You just yeah, know that. Watching the relationship between Gene and Craig is really cool too because it's like they fully support each other in, in their endeavors and what they want to do. Perfect. You know, I think we just work off each other's strengths. You know, he, he handles his part of the farm, I handle my part of the farm, and, and it just, I mean, it's a great partnership. I wouldn't, you know, want to do it by myself, so. It's just kind of sometimes can be quite a battle. So if you have somebody in the kind of in the trenches with you to take some of the heat off, it kind of gets to be that way. Or somebody that you know share the triumphs and the tribulations. You know. And meeting both Craig and Gene, um, uh, to me, very different personalities and and uh, brothers, and and just it's great to see how they work together. Uh, Gene's in charge of profit, Craig's in charge of productivity. And I, I, I think that's really a, a cool story. We believe sustainability is both economically as well as environmentally important. It means a great deal to John Deere to have growers like Gene and Craig use our technology and their data to sustainably and efficiently enable their farm. Usually in farming, if you want more yield, you have to spend more money. I mean, you gotta either put more seed, more chemical, more fertilizer or something on. With Precision Ag, you just have to buy the technology. You don't have to be investing in more product. You just put the product where it needs to be. The data just helps you make informed decisions so much easier because you have it with you, you can make that decision now. But we're in a business to make money, and one of the first things we realized was we had areas in our fields that you know, over a 10 year period, we're obviously not probably making us money. My role is to create profitability uh, analysis for farmers. So we're using the yield data, planting data, any variable rate maps that they may have, pair that with their crop inputs, and then create an analysis that shows what areas of the field are doing the best, which ones are underproducing that are not giving them a positive ROI and then looking to enroll maybe those marginal lands in some other, other conservation program, whether it's uh, the Soil Health and Habitat program, CRP, or a different working lands option that's out there so that we're making every acre count for those growers. If you look at 22 years worth of yield data, you can pretty much pinpoint without any problems areas that you don't want to farm. You can very easily take pieces out and put them into habitat and that's what we've done and it's worked out very well. 
I mean, these areas, they produce nothing. You're just throwing money and wasting money and resources by trying to grow a crop on them. So just better put them in the permanent vegetation and then you can either hay it or leave it for wildlife. So just a win-win. It's a win for the farmer, it's a win for the peasants, and it's a win for the environment. I've seen what the lack of conservation has done. I've seen the ditches full of dirt. I've seen the fence lines full of dirt. I've seen the, black, the dirty water running off the field. So, I mean, I think that just motivates you to do, try different practices to stop that from happening. And so, you know, their rotation is rock solid. Uh, they've included cover crops for many years. You know, they've, they've been on narrow row corn, just innovators from, from the get-go. If you're a no-till and you can't just leave this wheat stubble, it'll get too wet. You won't cycle the water. You have to have a living root growing after harvest. What we can do on our farm to improve soil health, you know, it has so many benefits for our profitability and protecting the environment and improving the habitat for wildlife, it just all kind of works together. The benefits for all three. The programs that we've adopted that are based in conservation are endless and, and we've been doing it for 40 years now and that's how, you know, we've ended up with all of this habitat that we just treasure. The pollinator plots, the riparian area, the food plots, the conservation areas, and it's just a, a, a mecca for, for, for wildlife and, and pheasants being a large part of that. This in particular, this habitat is really close to our heart. We've owned it since the 40s, and, uh, and so this one really means a lot to us. And it's been 14 years since we did it, and now it's kind of the poster child for uh, other folks along the fire steel that, you know, cause we are working on that fire steel watershed uh, cleanup effort. And this is what they all come look at because you know, it's 14 years established and look at, I mean, obviously, you know, the runoff is gonna be pretty much zero coming through this stuff. So, you know what, it's been a very educating thing and a, a lot of fun and, and it basically again, experimentation uh, uh, involving a whole bunch of people. Jean and Craig are deserving of this award for the amount of work that they put in since the 80s, uh, converting to no-till, including cover crops, having the small grain rotation into their, into their operation, and then noticing that certain land is not producing a profit and seeing the potential to put that back into a perennial. And they're large operators, they run large equipment, and for them to be able to put in those habitat acres, it proves that no matter what size operation you are, there's always room within any operation to include habitat. Our farm has seen the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to bird populations. We saw the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s with unbelievable bird numbers. The 70s came along and uh, we went to fence row to fence row farming. And uh, we devastated uh, the numbers of birds on our farm by about 90%. In fact, the entire state of South Dakota in the 70s had 10% of the bird population that they did in the 50s and 60s. So in the 80s, my brother and I decided that we we're gonna try to restore the numbers of pheasants on our farm. Uh, we're still trying, but we've made a lot of progress and we've had a lot of help. Uh, obviously, Pheasants Forever, NRCS, uh, Game Fish and Parks, we've had a lot of partners. Uh, it all started with the love of the bird, just like with you. And uh, I think we've proven that you can have a profitable farm and you have wildlife and uh, they can exist together uh, to the benefit of everyone. I'd like to thank John Deere, Pheasants Forever. Uh, this award means so much to me and my brother, uh, just because it's been a 40 year endeavor. We didn't do it for money. We didn't do it for 
uh, honors. We did it for the love of the pheasant. So thank you very much. They're the prime example of the conservation and production egg, working together to make farms be there for the next generation. John Deere is proud to be the official habitat tractor of Pheasants Forever, and we're proud to award the Pheasants Forever Farmer of the Year Award to Craig and Gene.